Why do you suppose this room is so quiet? Perhaps we can learn from the teacher, Miss Bradley. Well, I think it's because each of us helps to keep the room quiet when we're working. But we're not quiet all of the time. You're not? No. We know there are times and places to be quiet, and other times and places when we can make noise if we want to. For example... <laughs> fifties and sixties when I was in school versus what the students are exposed to now. Uh, my oldest boy works in a, a marketing company and it's just the opposite. There's always team meetings, they're always trying to solve problems. If he wants to leave that room and go get uh, a bowl of cereal, he could leave and go get a bowl of cereal. If he wants to go, they have rooms where uh, they could actually just relax, listen to music, and then come back to the work area. The day is not defined from 8 to 4.30. He could get in later if he wants to, stay later and do some work at home. But it's, it's very engaging. You know, one of the worst parts of school for me was sitting and reading out of a textbook. Um, I felt that, yeah, we learned all the material, but it w didn't really stick with us. Kids don't play kick the can anymore. Kids are on iPads, kids are on cell phones, kids are texting, and that's their life. The information that we have now is, is already out of date. The books we have now are already dated. It's we need to give them the tools and to give them the vision and the motivation to become self-directed learners. What we see in the kids that we're working with is they want an experience that means something to them personally. They want to be able to relate it into the context of their own lives or their own interests. Then they want to be able to reshape that story and tell it in the context of their own lives and interests. And then they want to be able to translate that into something they can do in the community, they can do whether that's an online community or a physical community. So it's really a, it's gone consumption, production, participation. Most students intrinsically feel learning is exciting. It's just we have to tap into the type of learning and, and, and these authentic learning uh, experiences and, and tap into those and, and then they will, will feel that, that learning is exciting as well. We need to get away from showing the students, well this is the formula for this or this is the way you can solve that. It's, it's putting the problem out there and help, helping them to, or guide them more than anything to try to figure out well, how else could you do it or is there another way so that when they get to the workforce they can, you know, uh, are able to work with other people and at the same time find other solutions in different ways. I think that that should be the way. First we try to figure out the problem, and then after that if we can't figure out and we're all stuck, then she teaches us how to do it, because then it gets us more anticipated into it. We have to teach kids there are multiple ways of getting to the answer, there's multiple ways of presenting how you acquire the answer, and that's where technology is exciting. But teachers will have to shift. Now this is the issue for schools, training. The changes that are happening with curriculum, um, with the federal government, all of those things are requiring us to change the way that we teach. It has to be purposeful. It has to be job embedded. We have to make sure that the supports are there for our teachers if we're expecting them to implement the changes that they need to make to help increase student achievement. And in order to do that, we have to look at professional learning different than the way we used to do it. Um, classroom teachers really need to be prepared. They really need to be trained. They need to have some professional developments on technology. If we are able to give our teachers those tools to bring the excitement of those devices into their classrooms, um, 
I think that the kids are going to light up and I think that they're going to think it's fun and they, they're going to think it's cool and they're going to then be more engaged in their learning. Part of the opportunity here is is learning the content, which is very much the 20th, 20th century idea around education. But in 21st century, it's learning the tools and the skills of remaking that content and becoming the creator and the producer. I think the foundations, I think the movement to get away from memorizing a list of stuff because you may need it someday is going away. And if we follow the intent of the standards, in, in all of the areas that they've been developed so far, the intent of the standard is to teach them how to think. And it doesn't matter what you need to know, you'll be able to know how to find it, how to process the information when you find the information that you need, and how to solve problems. And if you can do that, we don't have to know what you're gonna need in 30 years, because you'll be able to figure it out when you get there. education is not what it was 40 years ago. It is not reading, writing, and arithmetic. It is so much more about learning how to deal with life. It is learning how to work with a peer, learning how to use technology, learning how to discover the answer, learning how to figure out, I want this, but I can't get it, so where do I get it, and what do I have to do? And as a teacher, you're facilitating all that. If you walk into a classroom, you'll see kids in small groups or you'll see kids and partners, and you'll see kids walking around, but as they're walking around, they have a purpose, they have a goal. They know that they're walking to here, or they know that they're walking to there, and they know exactly what it is that they're supposed to do when they get there. And you see conversations. Our core curriculum's been written to the Common Core standards, which are higher, more difficult, sometimes even a grade level above, but they're aligned to what other countries and nations are expecting of their students so that when our students leave high school, they're ready to compete not only globally, but also be prepared for college and career. When I started teaching it, a lot of the things, it's like, this is what we've been doing. It's just giving us a more in-depth way of teaching it and different materials and more freedom to be creative with the children and to allow them to be creative. So it was really nice to see how a lot of them grasped the concepts a lot quicker because they had more freedom and more, it was more open to teaching and learning in different ways. We're collecting data so that we can make real-time decisions in the classroom. We're not waiting a year for information, we're not acting on year-old information or three-month-old information. We have something now that's immediate, that's useful for deciding what am I doing tomorrow, next week in the classroom, um, how are things going in the classroom, I can put in information so in two and three weeks I can make changes, not three times a year. Previously, the report cards in general didn't, didn't say much, so now when you get a grade, it won't be a, a letter grade, it'll be either exceeding or meeting or needing help and now as a parent you can go back and, and try to, to help them. I think that a high quality um, preschool helps build the foundation. I also think that we have been able to align with the district initiatives um, in the area of engagement and the area of um, bringing the Common Core standards down to preschool and this has uh, really helped to improve the scores of the children in our program. Oh, the changes in kindergarten are awesome. We're changing to full day, which means that students aren't just going to have two and a half hours of learning a skill. They're going to have time to learn the skill, practice the skill, interact with each other, have more one-on-one um, -on -one time with the teacher, and it's just a wonderful new program. The great advantage I think we have in this district and in this community is the diversity that we have in the community. I think it gives our students a significant advantage that becomes an international opportunity for them to work in other countries with other communities and I think that's a great advantage that our kids are going to have. District 33 takes so much pride in valuing second language. They embrace it and they embrace it so much that they that we feel that we should expand on teaching language so that the community itself, West Chicago, can ultimately be bilingual. As these kids move forward in their career, they will do something with it and they can say, I, I came from District 33. The change and the shift has to come from the ground up. We've got to involve the community. We have to have businesses involved. So we've got to cultivate those partnerships. We have strong relationships with 
the police department, the fire department. Those are all key people. When they say it takes a village to raise a child, it really does. It takes the community. And we all have to be involved in setting the vision for preparing students for a rapidly changing world. It takes a village because only one person has one insight. A village, everybody has different insight, different ways of problem solving, different ways of helping people through that situation. Nobody can do anything on their own. It's always better to have um, a group of people. The kids, I think they thrive on getting different opinions and learning different things from different people. Every kid, every adult uh, in this community steps up. They are the future of our community and they need to be a part of it. So it's very important that everybody stays involved. And the most important thing, our family, education, and the willing to work hard. And I think we'll continue to keep this community the great place that it is.